The Adventures of Mr. Tompkins was created by George Gamow, the renowned physicist who first proposed the physical model of the universe known as the Big Bang Theory. He is perhaps best known around the world for having created the curious and lovable bank clerk, C.G.H. Tompkins, a bank clerk who dresses as if he's the president of the bank. His understanding of mathematics is limited to the operations of addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, of which he uses only two. Nevertheless, he has a passion for attending science lectures. After the lecture, he goes home to bed and dreams that he has been transported, pajamas and all, to the time and place where the celebrated scientist lived and worked. The next morning, Mr. Tompkins wakes up enchanted by his new understanding of science. Igor Gamow is George Gamow's son and the creator of the Mr. Tompkins film series. Igor has worn many hats. A white hat of a cowboy hero, a black hat of the villain, a motorcycle hat of a White House courier, and a feathered hat as a member of the National Ballet Company. Today, he wears the hat of a professor. Good evening. Tonight's lecture is entitled, Madame Curie, the Mother of Radioactivity. What you have just seen, you all recognize as being the first atomic bomb exploded July 16, 1945, Almogorda, New Mexico. Now, I'm not suggesting to you that Madame Curie made the atomic bomb. She, of course, did not. Madame Curie had no idea that her discoveries about radioactivity might someday be used to develop an atomic bomb. Her goal was to use radioactivity to make advances in medicine and science, all of which came to pass. And had Madame Curie lived long enough to see the advent of nuclear weapons, she would have been sadly disappointed. Now, why do we call it the atomic bomb? An atom bomb. Does that mean that an atom is exploding? Well, you know, in one sense, it is true. There are many different kinds of uranium atoms. You had the most common everyday uranium atom, which is the atom that Beckerville used when he was exposing his film with the uranium salts. But if you look at an individual uranium atom, and it decides, I'm not trying to tell you it's thinking about it, because we have no idea when an atom will disintegrate, a word that Rutherford used. But when it does, it is a mini explosion. The everyday uranium will explode once, let go of an alpha, a beta, and a gamma ray, and that's the end of it. In the work of the atomic bomb, you had a particular kind of uranium. And this uranium would release a particle, a neutron, which could now stimulate other uranium atoms of the same breed to release more energy and more energy and more energy, and you get a chain reaction, and finally you have the atomic bomb. Today, every school child knows that atoms are consisted of subatomic particles. But this, of course, is quite a recent concept resting on the shoulders of people like Madame Curie, her husband Pierre, and Rutherford. Up to that time, scientists and philosophers, from almost the beginning of time, from a man called Democritus, which is 5th century BC, predicted that there were atoms. And these atoms would never change. Now, you might ask me, how did Democritus in the 5th century BC predict atoms? And I'll give you a good example. Let us say I have a sheet of paper my tool. And I take it and I cut the paper in two. I tear the paper in two. I get two pieces. 
And now again, four pieces. And again, eight pieces, 16 pieces, 32, 64. How many times can I divide this piece of paper and every piece that I get is still paper? And 500 BC, there were two schools of thought. One school said, oh, you could do it forever, ever and ever and ever. It'll always be paper. And Democritus said, I know. I think that when you get small enough, you will get an individual particle that is not divisible anymore. And we call that particle an atom. A without torn cutting. And this concept that atoms of the most basic and the end of the line in terms of material. Everything can be constructed by atoms, and you can't go any further. That's a wonderful insight of Democritus. Another insight of Democritus, and I tried to find a quote exactly because I heard it from my professor when I was taking physics many, many years ago, but Democritus, in his wisdom, said, perhaps there is sweetness, perhaps there's bitterness, but in reality, there's only atoms and void. So no matter if you go to a movie and you weep and you're sorry and all these things, human effects, it's all atoms and void. And if that doesn't depress you, I don't know what would depress you. Now, Madame Curie, although she was basically a physicist and a mathematician, was very familiar with chemistry. And certainly she was familiar with chemical explosions. And even the early chemists could take an equation like gasoline. You put gasoline in your car, it combines with oxygen, you have an explosion, and on the right side of the equation, you have water, heat, and a lot of other stuff. That's a chemical explosion. The energy comes from the chemical bonds. Probably the most well-known explosion right now is what drives the space shuttle. That these big, big tanks. You have one huge tank filled with liquid hydrogen and another with liquid oxygen, and you just mix them. Well, you don't mix them right away, you mix them very judiciously, but the energy of oxygen, O2, plus H2 going to water and a huge explosion is what drives the space shuttle up. It's a typical example of a chemical explosion. Now, chemical explosions like a forest fire, your burning house, these are all chemical. But in the universe, most explosions are not chemical. They are atomic, better word would be nuclear. In fact, the origin of the universe was actually what was called the Big Bang Theory of the Universe, first proposed by my father and his students back in 1948, and known as the Big Bang Theory of the Universe. Now, I started my lecture with an atomic bomb mentioning that Madame Curie laid the first brick that had left, led to the atomic bomb. So I now want to go back and talk about her exclusively because she is probably one of the most unique scientists, woman or man, that we've ever had. It was tough when she was only 10 or 11, her mother died. And that had a tremendous effect on her. But she was still going to school under terrible circumstances and graduated highest in her class when she was 15 years old. She made a, a deal with her sister that she would work for a number of years and send the money to her sister, for the sister could become a doctor, and then when the sister is earning money, she would send money to Maria. And um, 
and she would be able to study. In 1891, she had enough money, just enough money, to go to Paris and pay the tuition at the wonderful, beautiful Sorbonne University in Paris. She had to almost stand on the trainway because she didn't have enough money to sit in the chair, but she wisely brought her own chair for she could sit. And so she entered the university, and um, when I read about her in a biography, she reminded me of the opera La Boheme, you know, living in very, very tough circumstances in a cold water flat. It was so cold she had to sleep with her clothes on. After she finished her degree at the Sorbonne, she began working at an industrial school doing experiments on magnetic properties of various steels. It was there she met a teacher at the school, Pierre Curie. She fell in love with Pierre, and they married in 1895. She was now Madame Curie. Two years later, they had their first child, Irene. She decided that she would like to do a PhD. That a woman doing a PhD in the Sorbonne was just unheard of. But just like students today, she needed to find a subject. What does she want to work on? And the whole country was aglow with two discoveries, one made by Wilhelm Röntgen in Germany, in which he took a cathode ray tube, a glass tube, which is electrified anode um, cathode, a rarefied gas, and he found it emitted from this tube was an X-ray. And one of the most famous photographs in science is the hand photographed by the first X-ray machine. The other discovery was by a man named Becquerel, Henri Becquerel. And he was a third generation scientist and, um, and sort of did a lot of different things. He was interested in rocks that absorbed energy from the sun and perhaps re-radiated. So it's fluorescence and phosphorescence. But he accidentally found, and this was sheer accident, that some uranium salts that he had inherited from his father, his father was a photographer and uranium salts were made to enhance photographs, when put into the drawer next to some photographic film, all wrapped up in black paper, that this film became exposed, although there's no light around any place. And he said, is it possible that like Runkin's x-ray, something came out of this uranium and exposed the film? Now, this was a simple experiment to do compared to Runkin's x-ray machine. All you have to do is take some of his crystals, put it onto a photographic plate, which is completely hidden from light. And as soon as he did that, all of France was aglowed and said, ah, oh, we have another ray. So you had the Runkin ray, X-rays, and you had the Becquerel ray. And Madame Curie, she is now Madame, and she's now a Curie, decided that that interested her more than the X-rays. So she got a number of elements, the number of elements at that time were fairly small. She identified thorium as a radioactive element. So now we have uranium and we have thorium. And she was looking at a lot of different minerals and she ran across one mineral called pitchblende. Now in her studies with uranium, she made the discovery, of which was part of her Nobel Prize, that the uranium gave off something we call the uranium ray, which was not affected. The uranium, no matter what you did with it, you could heat it, you could cool it, you could acidify it, you could pulverize it. But the amount of radiation coming off was only a function of the number of uranium atoms. This was a major, major discovery because it told her it's not chemistry. Because in chemistry, you have things that smell different, 
different colors, different viscosities. But no matter what you did to this crystal, it was only the uranium that counted. So that was her first insight that there was something inside the uranium atom that caused this radiation. And this is why I said she laid the first brick. The second wonderful insight was that once she knew that it was uranium, she found a mineral called pitchblend, originally coming from Bohemia. And the radiation in this pitchblend was far greater than the number of uranium atoms that she could calculate and measure in there. And she concluded there must be something else, radioactive, which has never been discovered before. Because there are about, in, in pitch blend, there are about 30 different types of atoms. And so she had a quest to find this unknown radiation. Now, she had a tremendous help in doing this from her husband, Pierre, because years and years before they had met, he and his brother had invented a machine called an electrometer. It was an electric machine in which you, if you have ionized molecules, a molecule like an air, what has a charge on it, it would give you an indication. Now, in radioactivity, you produce charged particles. So instead of using a photographic plate like Becquerel did, she was able to use Pierre's electrometer on every sample and determine how much radioactivity it was. So now she would divide the sample in two and treat it one way, treat it another way, treat it a third way, and see if the radioactivity increased or decreased. And this was a laborious job. But at that point, her husband got so interested in that experiment, he joined her. And so now we had years and years of being able to trace the new elements that you found in pitch blend. The first one she found was polonium, named after her beloved country, Poland. And the next one was radium. At that point, when she had these two elements, and she hadn't purified them, but she could identify them and name them, but the Nobel Committee in 1903 awarded her and Pierre and Becquerel, the three of them, a Nobel Prize. Now you might think at that point she would sort of, you know, rest on her laurels, but she and Pierre went through incredible, long, long extractions to be able to purify radium and polonium. And of course now we know that uranium, the common everyday uranium, when it decays, it has a family of decaying, becomes radium, and then it becomes polonium, which has a very short half-life, the half-life that Rutherford had actually first described, and finally goes to lead. And in 1911, Madame Curie received a second Nobel Prize in chemistry for the work that she and Pierre did in isolating the two new radioactive elements, radium and polonium. She was the first person to get two Nobel Prizes and the first woman to get a Nobel Prize on, on her own. It was just a marvelous time. Um, at that time, she became very famous, much to her distress. She was basically a shy woman. She was happy in the laboratory. She was not happier with what we call the news media right now. And Pierre started work on radium, although he probably did much damage to himself because both he and his wife were both suffering, as we think right now, from radiation sickness. But he, with Madame Curie, found that if you take radium, radium would go through any kind of material like wood, but it would also kill human cells. And Im immediately, the medical world got very interested because maybe you could cure cancer. And even today, of course, we have radiation theory all the time. Another medical breakthrough was that when radium 
decays, you get radon, and radon gives off, it's a gas, and it will also kill cells, and this gas was used for medical thing. Um, because of her discoveries, because of her incredible humanity, the French government gave her money to start an institute called the Radium Institute, of which she was the director. But on the opening day, almost the opening day, First World War broke out. And so the Institute was sort of put on the back burner. But Madame Curie, knowing the benefit not only of radium in curing human ills, knew about x-rays because soldiers who are shot and bandaged and broken bones, if you had some way to determine what was going on inside them. So Madame Curie went around to all the rich compatriots around Paris and begged them for their cars and trucks and anything. And she equipped these with x-ray machines. And there's a wonderful photograph of her sitting, driving one of these cars with the x-ray machines. Um, and they were called Petite Curies. In 1921, she successfully toured the United States to raise money for research on radium. It was a sad irony that her ongoing exposure to radium during her lifetime caused her to contract the disease leukemia, which she died from in 1934. The last really thing that I know that she did would have affected my life directly, that my father and my mother were escaping from Russia at that time, and really escaping because of Stalin. They were supposed to have been shot. They ended up in the Solvay Congress, and father, of course, didn't have any money when he came out, and both Niels Bohr and Madame Curie gave um, him money for he could come to this country, become a professor at George Washington University, and then in 1935 had me. And um, so I often thought, if it wasn't for Madame Curie, I probably wouldn't be here. So that's the end of my story, and I thank you for listening. Mr. Tompkins, will you please get back into your seat? Did you not hear me? Get back in your seat. You are perfectly safe. Safe? You call this safe? What is going on here? We are in the midst of a battle between my beloved France and its German invaders. You know it best as World War I. Ah! Get us out of here. How about a calm, quiet library? It is a children's library, but it will have to do. I can't make the cacophony of the bomb bursts disappear completely, but I can transform them into the voices of children. Not much of a difference, usually. Thankfully, the children here seem to be studious, quiet ones. Well, thank you for whisking us away from that dreadful war, madame, but how are we there in the first place? Oh, we are still there, monsieur. It is just that I have created a panic room within your unconscious mind where you can safely withdraw and be more apt to learn something. Well, this is much better, thank you. But you still haven't told me who you are. Well, wait a minute. You're who Professor Igor lectured about earlier today. Exactement, monsieur. Madame Dr. Mary Sklodowska Curie. I'm very pleased to meet you, madame. Recently, I learned of your adventures from Professor Igor Gamov. Perhaps you know him? In his lecture about you, he told of what a great scientist you are, how you discovered polonium and radium. You were the first person to win two Nobel Prizes, the first woman to earn a Nobel Prize, the first woman professor at the Sorbonne University, the first European woman to receive a PhD in physics, and the first director of the Radium Institute. It is such a great honor to meet such an esteemed lady of science. And my apologies, madame, for meeting you in my pajamas. I shall rectify the situation straight away. There. I feel much more dignified now. A much more suitable ensemble befitting the historic first meeting of two such renowned adventurers as we. 
Indeed. Monsieur Tompkins, now you look almost presentable. Almost? Wait a second. How do you know my name? And I'd still like to know why we were in the middle of a battle. To answer your first question, Monsieur, I happen to have followed your amusing adventures for many years. In the Mr. Tompkins series of books by Professor George Gamow, Professor Igor's father, I suppose that makes him your father too, in a way. And to answer your second question, we were in the middle of a war because just after the Radium Institute opened, Germany invaded France, and all the male personnel joined the military to defend our country. The Institute was abandoned. Wanting to help the war effort, I designed a way to use X-rays to diagnose the location of shrapnel and bullets in the wounded soldiers. With X-ray machines, surgeons were able to save many soldiers who would otherwise have lost life or limb. To aid our cause, wealthy Parisians donated trucks like the one we were in. I had them converted into mobile transports for our X-ray machines. My daughter Irene was one of the X-ray technicians and drove one of these vehicles. Under my guidance, the Red Cross took over one million X-rays during the war. So you and your crew were the forerunners of the MASH units used in the Korean War by the American military. Those battle surgeons later depicted on the TV show. Oui, monsieur. Unfortunately, however, you and your fellow Americans at times depict war as entertainment instead of the true tragedy it is. Um, so after the war, did you go back to Paris and continue your directorship of the Radium Institute? Oui, uh, that I did. But since I had donated most of my money to France during the war, I had little left to buy radium for my research. It was very expensive, you see. Thankfully, Missy Maloney, an American journalist and admirer of mine, encouraged women in the United States to donate $150,000 to buy me a gram of radium. In 1921, I, along with my daughters Irene and Eve, traveled to America to pick up this gram of radium, which was presented to us by no less than the President of the United States himself, Monsieur Warren G. Harding. In 1923, I wrote a biography of Pierre, and here you see the inscription I wrote for Missy's copy. So without Missy and the women of America, you couldn't have carried on your research at the Institute, huh? That's right, because even though the Institute had a gram of radium, other researchers constantly wanted access to it. Now I had a gram of radium for my own research. I wished Pierre had been there to work with me, but at least I had Irene. In 1925, she became a doctor of science after writing a thesis on the alpha rays of polonium. The next year, she married an assistant of mine, Friedrich Joulot. And in another example of my family's bulking at the status quo, they each changed their last names to Joulot Curie. They were quite a team. They built on the experiments of Crocroft, Walton, and Rutherford, who first showed that if one hits an atomic nucleus with an accelerated proton, one can create a new element. In 1934, Irene and Friedrich extended these early experiments by bombarding a mass 10 boron nucleus with a mass 4 helium nucleus, also known as an alpha particle. In this way, they made nitrogen-13, the first radioisotope or radioactive isotope. The nitrogen-13 was accompanied by one lonely neutron with nowhere to go. Isotope? What's that? An isotope is a variant of a chemical element that has a different atomic mass than its cousins. For example, boron-10 and boron-11 are two different isotopes of the same element, boron. They each have the same number of protons, five. 
but boron 10 has 5 neutrons and boron 11 has 6 neutrons. This isotope number is also called the mass number. Nitrogen 13, however, has a very short half-life, which is the time it takes for one half of the radioactive material to disintegrate. Nitrogen 13's half-life is less than 10 minutes, and when the nitrogen 13 atom decayed, Irene and Frederick got a carbon 13 atom, which is a stable, naturally occurring isotope constituting approximately 1.1% of all carbon on Earth. Irene and Frederick soon repeated the process with aluminium and magnesium and got radioisotopes of phosphorus from the aluminium and silicon from the magnesium. Consequently, they radically transformed the periodic table of chemical elements, which soon grew to include more than 400 radioisotopes. For their discoveries, they received a Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1935, and Irene eventually became the third director of the Radium Institute in 1946. These custom radioactive elements have been used for a great variety of products both industrial and medical. For example, some of the artificially radioactive elements created are even used in common modern-day smoke detectors. These ionization smoke detectors contain 0.9 microcuries of the radioactive element americium-241 and... Wait a second. A microcurie? A small u? No, you foolish man. You are funny when I read your adventures, but in person you can be most annoying. A curie is a unit of measure used for calculating the radioactivity of a nuclear substance. For example, one gram of radium undergoes 37 billion nuclear transformations every second. That's 37 billion atoms decay and emit one particle of radiation each and every second. One gram of radium generates one curie of activity, with one microcurie being equivalent to one millionth of one curie. And uh, I have to say, after explaining all this to you, that the curie as a unit of radioactive measurement has been replaced by the becquerel. A becquerel is one disintegration per second. Understood? Oh, good. So, in the way of the medical applications of these custom elements, for instance, in 1938, four years after my death, the scientists John Livingood and Glenn T. Seaborg used Irene and Frederick's discoveries as a stepping stone to their creation of iodine-131, also known as radioiodine. It is used by physicians to ensure the thyroid gland is able to produce the hormones regulating body metabolism, the chemical process of obtaining energy from food. Iodine from food naturally accumulates in the thyroid. But as they say, there can be too much of a good thing. So if the thyroid is overactive, too much of the hormones are made, thus speeding up the body's metabolism and causing hyperthyroidism. Radioiodine is used to treat hyperthyroidism. It is also used to treat thyroid cancer because it discriminatingly damages cancer cells, which grow only in the thyroid, without adversely dosing the rest of the body with radiation. Iodine-131 can be used to treat cancer, or it also can create cancer, as in the case of exposure to nuclear fallout, for it is a common product resulting from the detonation of nuclear weapons, contaminating vegetables and livestock as it settles. If the body gets too much iodine due to consuming radiation-contaminated food, hyperthyroidism can occur, as well as cancer. It was exposure to radiation that made you and Pierre sick, wasn't it? And Irene as well. She and I both died as a result of our lifetimes of exposure. Today there is no doubt in my mind that we were indeed suffering from radiation sickness. 
Even in 1920, 14 years before my death, I had an inkling that perhaps radium was the culprit. When I experienced eyesight trouble and an incessant humming in my ears, I must admit that my pride prevented me from fully accepting this, and I pretended that nothing was wrong, confiding only to my sister that anything was the matter. I had no idea back in 1903, when Monsieur Henri Becquerel, Pierre and I were awarded the Nobel Prize. Pierre and I were too sick to travel to Stockholm to claim it, and had to wait two more years to do so. But again, at the same time, Pierre and I were both aware of the power of radioactivity to heal, and it was ironically due to Pierre's experiments on himself. For ten hours, he strapped a sample of radium salt to his forearm, then noted the resulting burns, scabs, and the dead tissue. As the radiation killed tissue, he wondered if it would kill tumors. Working with some Parisian medical doctors, he found that radium, when placed close to the growing tumor, killed the growing cancer cells. So, it was his pioneer spirit which led to the later breakthroughs by researchers in nuclear medicine. As a result of Pierre's findings, however, a radium craze overtook the world. Radium became the universal panacea for all problems. A multitude of products flooded the market. I, of course, had nothing to do with any of them. The products that had the radium were no doubt dangerous. But most of them did not have anything slightly radioactive in them at all. Radium simply became an adjective used to show what high quality an item was, much like the gold standard or platinum edition is today. Unfortunately, no one realized exactly how dangerous radium was, and many people began to get sick from radiation poisoning. One prominent case involved the Radium Luminous Materials Corporation. During the Great War, this company employed many women in painting wristwatch dials, numbers and hands, so they would glow in the dark. In order to keep the tips of their brushes sharp as they dipped them into the radium paint, the women put them in their mouths. This, of course, made them very sick. In 1928, five of the women made sick by their former company's disregard for safety brought forth a lawsuit against the Radium Luminous Materials Corporation. Though they eventually got an out-of-court settlement, all five women died by the early 1930s. That's horrible. Well, to change the subject to something hopefully a little more cheery, what about your other daughter, Eva? Was she a scientist too? No, she wasn't, but I am just as proud of the wonderful person she became. Our family was basically shy. We never sought attention, and we disdained jewelry and makeup. Elf, however, was quite different than Irene, Pierre, and me. She was outgoing, proudly wore jewelry and makeup, and was almost always the center of attention. When Irene, Ev, and I toured America in 1921, Ev dealt with the news media. They dubbed her the girl with the radium eyes. Many years later, Ev and her husband, Henri Louis, were involved with UNICEF. He was the American ambassador to Greece and the executive director of UNICEF when it was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1965 and she was herself director of UNICEF in Greece from 1962 to 1965. In a broad sense, then, the Curies have been associated with four Nobel Prizes. Oui, monsieur, but I do not like to brag. Eve was also a published author and wrote a wonderful biography entitled Madame Curie, a Biography, which is a loving memoir of our family. I am so pleased that the book has inspired children around the world, particularly girls, to go into science. I am glad she did not follow in my footsteps, for she lived to be 102 years old and did much good for the world. Professor Igor in his lecture said that your work laid the first brick which led to the creation of the atomic bomb. 
which I'm sure you're not happy about, had you any idea that some of your scientific work would result in the unleashing of this terrible weapon? In my lifetime, I hoped that our work with radiation would be only a benefit to humankind. But Pierre had his concerns, which he voiced in his Nobel acceptance speech in 1905. I remember his words as if he spoke them yesterday. One can imagine that in criminal hands, radium could become very dangerous. And here, one can ask if humanity is at an advantage in knowing nature's secret. If it is mature enough to make use of them, or if this knowledge might not be harmful to it. The example of the discoveries of Nobel is a case in point. Powerful explosives have allowed men to do admirable work. They are also a terrible means of destruction in the hand of criminals who lead people into war. I'm among those who think with Nobel that humanity will derive more good than bad from new discovery. I shouldn't have eaten those atomic fireball jawbreakers right before bed. 